Hello. We won't keep you long. I know we've kept you waiting days on end for the vote that didn't happen, but finally did. It was the Christmas miracle we were all hoping for, which was to send a positive signal to the people on the ground in Gaza who are suffering under such unbearable circumstances that the council is engaged 24-7 on trying to alleviate that suffering. And that is why we've all, in our different capacities, and I thank each and every person here who has contributed in this group, but in particular, the Ambassador of Egypt, uh, Ambassador Sama, and in particular, Dr. Riyadh, the Ambassador of Palestine, for the immense support behind the scenes into trying to adopt and achieve a resolution that has impact on the ground uh, for the people who need it the most. Last week, the UAE uh, took a number of Security Council members, both current and incoming, to the Rafah border crossing because often we sit in these rooms and we negotiate text endlessly without understanding sometimes the full implications of what is happening on ground. And I think that trip facilitated by the government of Egypt where we saw so much evidence of that suffering, so many thousands of trucks that were not able to go into Gaza despite the fact that Gazans today are classified, half of the population is starving, and that famine is a very real possibility in Gaza as we go into our Christmas celebrations and holiday and festive season celebrations. So keeping people at the forefront of our work is when the council does its best diplomacy. And although the situation is still bleak uh, and dark, I hope this is a glimmer of hope uh, ahead that we can unite uh, both as an Islamic and Arab group, but also in the Security Council to try and deliver outcomes that are actionable, operationalable, and mean something to people on the ground. And I know other speakers have mentioned what this resolution does. I know you've read it several iterations of it. I'm often amazed how often I see it in the press before I've even distributed it to the council members, so well done you. Um, but I think this resolution really does have key uh, aspects that are going to be important, not just in the months, but also in the years ahead, with putting a firm UN presence on the ground in the form of a mechanism, with appointing a special coordinator to oversee those efforts, with calling on all parties to respect international humanitarian law, with scaling up humanitarian aid into Gaza uh, and expanding the access routes to that aid, uh, and in calling for the first time in a council document for a cessation of hostilities. This is important language, uh, and we will continue to build on that language. So uh, maybe my colleagues would like to say a few words, and perhaps you'd like to ask a question. Yeah. First, you said in the council diplomacy isn't always what you uh, want, but what you can get. Do you feel like you got enough, and what's the next step if not? I think, uh, uh, again, putting people on the ground uh, first and foremost in mind, it would be really easy just to go for rhetorical declarations and end without consensus where we adopt something. Uh, that doesn't help people on the ground. So I feel that what we have done will have impact, will save lives on the ground. And again, as I said in the Council, I have to thank uh, the United States for their close collaboration, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield for her close collaboration in trying to achieve that outcome. We had the goal of saving lives on the ground in mind. Of course, it was not a perfect resolution. Of course, everyone in this group has called for a permanent ceasefire, and we support uh, what we put forward in the General Assembly that had 153 votes in favor for that ceasefire. And the UAE did submit that resolution less than 10 days ago, and it was, it was not adopted. So we can go for declarations in the council, or we can try and have impact on the ground for people who need it the most. Civilians in Gaza are dying because of the war. Uh, 20,000, 60% women and children, that is a fact. It's also a fact that several thousand more will die, as predicted by UN agencies, from lack of food, lack of water, lack of access to basic medical supplies. People are dying from infections. There is widespread spread disease. And so when we went to the Rafah border and we called for a code red moment as we listened to the UN officials on ground, I think that has led into the discussions here today, which led to an outcome. But it's not perfect. It's diplomacy. Ambassador, you've spoken about widespread support for s actions such like this outside the council. Can you talk us through ex not opening this resolution up to co-sponsors? Obviously, the first iteration had a lot of co-sponsors, which shows that there was a lot of widespread member support and they wanted to publicly continue that support. What was the discussion around not opening it up to co-sponsors, this Absolutely. particular resolution? Absolutely. So I'd like to say that this resolution, the genesis, was a mandate from the ministerial meeting in Riyadh. Uh, in Saudi Arabia 
in November to try and bring a humanitarian resolution to the Security Council, and there was a lot of iterations of that work, uh, and we opened it for co-sponsorship to the resolution we put in blue on Friday evening, which achieved 83 or 82 co-sponsors, I believe, which is very high for a council resolution on, of a humanitarian nature, and it shows the support. We did not open the resolution we put into blue for co-sponsorship simply because the negotiations were so last minute, so complicated. Uh, there was a lot of different exchange of views. You saw us meet here in the council several times and in close consultation. As Ambassador Greenfield said, there was numerous phone calls, five in the morning, midnight. And the, this resolution went into blue this morning, I believe at 9 a.m. Uh, so to go through the co-sponsorship, and by the way, the SCAD e-delegate sponsorship system is complicated, and so to go to open it up didn't feel necessary. I think the resolution before was a clear signal. I think the General Assembly ceasefire resolution is a clear signal, uh, and I think today's adoption with 13 votes in favor is a clear signal, and now we will all follow up on implementation. This creates a reporting structure to the Security Council of what is going into Gaza and what is not going into Gaza. And there is accountability in that. Thank you. Um, I was wondering why you made a compromise in terms of OB2. You could have pushed the US to veto and you could uh, take advantage of it. Again, I think our uh, our objective and our obligation was primarily humanitarian to try and help save lives for the people on the ground. The amendment that was put to the vote today showed the majority view of the council, which was to have had the original language from the uh, resolution on Friday. The veto gets people nothing. The veto is simply a political declaration, but its, a, it's failure to adopt means that it doesn't have impact for lives on the ground. What we did today establishes a number of principles and a robust architecture to respond to the humanitarian crisis that I've just outlined. Uh, and I think, you know, bearing in mind that the suffering is an immense, that it will get worse if aid and medicine and food and water does not go in, I think we did the right thing. Of course, history uh, is full of uh, 2020 in hindsight moments. But I think we did the right thing, right thing today with the tools that we had and with the global dynamics that we have in this international community. We used it to the best of our ability to help save lives.